Now we're going to talk to an old friend of ours who I'm just an enormous fan of and just think is such a major, major talent. And it's amazing that we haven't had him on this podcast before. It is Kyle Brandt, uh, currently of Good Morning Football on the NFL Network, and in a past life worked with Dan and myself at Fox Sports 1. But first of all, Kyle, how, how are you? How's the family doing all that stuff, the pandemic? How's it affecting you? Buddy? It's fine. The kids are asleep. Uh, I'm learning about myself like we all are. Um, I've been thinking about you recently, Jay. I'll tell you why. I was on another podcast, the inimitable uh, Jimmy Trainer from Sports Illustrated, and we were talking sports media. And we were talking about people who are authentic in sports media, because I think about 50 to 60 to 80 percent of people in that industry are posers. But there's a couple who are really authentic. And he's like, well, what do you mean? Like, who comes to mind? You know who I said? I said Scott Van Pelt. But I should have I said it. you, Jay. I, I should have said it. you, and I've regretted it. I was like, why didn't I say Jay? <laughs> I should have said you, and I, and I wish I could go back on and re-record it, because I'm a big fan of yours. You're the real deal, and I like it. Well, I listened to that podcast. I waited for not my name to be spoken. It wasn't. <laughs> I shed a single tear as I drove down the 401. <laughs> And then I moved on and because I love you guys together. I think you guys uh, think the same way that I do on so many different things, especially sports media. We're all into uh, the business of sports media. That's why yeah. I listen to Jimmy's podcast every week. It's great. If you, don't, if you have, haven't listened to it, it's uh, the SI Media podcast. Yeah. Media hosts, and Kyle was on it. It was just great. But um, for you, uh, one person that you ver work very closely with is very familiar to our podcast audience, Kyle, and that is Mr. Peter Schreger. And I'm curious to, what I wanted to ask you right off the top was, first time you met Peter, like first impressions of Peter, was it one of those things where, like when I first met you, I thought I could be friends with this guy, no problem. When you first met Peter, uh, were you like, this guy seems like a, a, a problem. I'm going to have a problem with this guy. No, this is a good question. I remember I used to watch a lot of Sopranos and the actor, I wish I knew his name, but the actor who played... Um, Johnny Sack and Sopranos, his acting method was he would assign every character, they would compare him to an animal, and that's how he would work. And he described himself mm. as a cobra, and he would describe Gandolfini as a grizzly bear. Peter has a very animal-like quality. Um, he is sort of like, like Baloo from the Jungle Book. Like he's very tall, <laughs> he's a little, little bit rotund, depending on the time of year. And right. he's so friendly and so outgoing. And yet, Jay, Peter Schrager will punch you if you try to hug him. Not a hugger, not in right. any way. Like some guys just don't hug. And so I remember thinking he was really friendly and we like to say in pop culture references, but then when we were saying goodbye or whatever, I was like, oh man, it's great to meet. I went for the hug and he almost yeah. like Earl Campbell stiff armed me. So it was a complex <laughs> legacy for Schrager. He's so friendly and he loved the Schrager bombs. Don't you dare hug Peter Schrager. Well, he is very, you're right, so so well read. Sometimes he'll send me book recommendations. I'm like, yeah. first of all, how do you have time to read? You have a son, you have, you have this full-time gig with the NFL Network, you're doing the Fox stuff. I don't know how he has time to read, but yeah, he's so well-rounded, so well-read. On occasion, rotund, that's true. Uh, has seen the killers more than any other person <laughs> in the world. Like, who else? who else has seen the killers, like, 30 times. I don't even know if Brandon Flowers' family has seen the killers that many times. So he has all these unique things about him, yeah. uh, but you're right. Then he's also kind of elusive too, right? He, maybe he doesn't want you to get too close to him, not just figuratively, but you know, literally he doesn't That's want you true. to get too close to him. Mr. Traeger has seen the killers more than Mrs. Flowers. <laughs> like there's people who count how many fish shows they've been to, how many yes. times they saw the dead. I get that. How many times you've yep. seen Bruce? Like, Nobody counts how many times you've seen the killers. Like, no, he's the guy. No. He loves them. No, he's Mr. Brightside. He, it would, but there's a certain I now I think because I think for you and I, they were a little after that time in our musical life where you find that band that you're just with thick or thin, right? I think we we had to be a little younger for that. And Shreg's a little younger than us, so I think that's why he's so deeply, deeply into the killers. And they have a new record out, and he's probably like, This is it. This is the one that's yeah, gonna get him back. I'm on not top. familiar. But Jay, you right. hit the nail on the head. Like I, I've always admitted very candidly that my music intake and my maturation pretty much stopped right around college. Like I, I didn't keep going. I just still listen to the same stuff I listened to in high school and college. So right. if it wasn't, you know, some sort of old Pearl Jam or Metallica album or something, like I don't really know it. It's just I don't right. have the energy to find the new music and I'm not that cool. So I think you might be right. I might have just missed the cuffs, the cusp of, what's his name? Brandon Flowers? I don't even know if that's his name. I just right. 
Yeah, exactly. What, well, okay, so Pearl Jam. So uh, you're a Pearl yeah. Jam guy, right? Massive. I'm a Pearl Jam guy. So I have a question for you. I brought this up on the, on the podcast previously. I assume you loved The Last Dance. I assume you watched it. I assume yes. that was a part of, you know, for me, that took me, back to, you know, I took me back to high school. I loved it so much. Yeah. Um, I just loved seeing the footage. It just made me feel like, it just gave me that nostalgic feeling like, man, I remember when everyone in my school desperately wanted Jordans and, and it was just so exciting and that team yeah. was so exciting. The choice of music throughout I thought was really good. I thought the soundtrack was fantastic until the Pearl Jam song at the end. I actually had a problem with that at the end. And this is coming from a massive Pearl Jam fan only because Yes, do I think Jed Bushler was listening to Pearl Jam at the time? Yes, I do. Yes, I do, Kyle Brandt. But do I think that Scotty and Jordan and Rodman and Phil Jackson, frankly, were listening to Pearl Jam? I don't think they were listening to Pearl Jam. I think they could have chosen a better final song, but I, I send it over to you now. All right, Jay, I have a lot to say on this. I'm from Chicago, born and raised like one town over from the Bear, the Bulls practice facility. So uh, we used to see the Bulls driving around and I would see the Ferrari that said Air 23. I mean, those were gods wow. I lived amongst. I'm also a really big Pearl Jam fan. Now, lest anyone does not understand the reference we're making here, in the final moments of the final episode of The Last Dance, they're wrapping it up and Steve Kerr is telling a story about Phil Jackson and a, a poem that he wrote that he burned. Then come the opening bars from a track called Present Tense off the No Code album from 1996. And it's a very slow, and then it gets turned into a fast jam. I got to tell you, Jay, I was in heaven. It was heroin to me. The 90s Bulls and 90s Pearl Jam at the same time was fantastic. And I would only counter your argument, which I think otherwise is good, that it maybe didn't represent the Bulls. You have to remember, Dennis Robin was a massive Pearl Jam fan. Massive. Right. He was friends with Eddie and Jeff. He would go to all their concerts. I remember seeing Stone Temple Pilots in about 95 and Rodman came out and introduced them. So part of that weird Rodman allure was that he was this six foot eight power forward who loved, you know, like the meat puppets. Like he loved grunge. Right, and so right. Judd Bushler for sure, Kerr for sure. <laughs> but I think Rodman was headbanging to present tense at the end of the song. Dickie Simpkins, probably not. Tony Kukoc, I doubt it. But Rodman, yes. Yeah. Kukoc was listening to a thousand percent. Kukoc was like all the NHL players at the time, the Roman Hammerlicks. All, <laughs> all the Europeans, it was all Scandinavian death metal 24-7. So Kukoc would have picked something from Napalm Death, and the producer's <laughs> like, you know what, honestly, that's a little heavy for the end of this one. Let's go with Pearl Jam from the No Code album, which I believe was their fourth album, right? Yeah. So... Yes, I, I do like the as a band. Yeah, you can't go wrong. Wow, what was it like? We talk about Chicago a lot. Um, I just think it's such a spectacular city. And I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but uh, it must have been so incredible to grow up in that city at that time, Kyle. That must have just been such a blast. I won the childhood sports fan Powerball. I, I was a kid in the north suburbs of Chicago in the 90s. And I, I mean, look, I had the Sosa chase, I had yes. Wrigley, um, but I was there for six championships. And I mean this, yeah. I, I lived in a town called Lincolnshire, which is really close to a, count, a town called Deerfield, where the Bulls practice. It was a place called the Multiplex. So all the time you would hear that Horace Grant was at TGI Fridays last night and he was there and he ordered this. And my dad was like super aggro and like my dad was very hands-on and super cool. And he said one day, he said, come with me, we're gonna go on a ride. And we drove to the Multiplex where the Bulls practiced and he brought a ball and a marker and he wanted to get Jordan's autograph. This is probably 1991 or something. And I stood there outside the security gate. They just let you do it. The gate opens. We're there for maybe an hour. And I see Bill Cartwright drive by. And I see John Paxson drive by. And I see Horace Grant drive by. And then sure enough, a black Ferrari with Air 23 pulls up and I wave him down. They stop. He stops. Window comes down. Now here's how I remember it, Jay. The second the window comes down, he is blaring um, Rhythm Nation by Janet Jackson. Just blaring. Yes! It. And yes! there's so much cologne pouring out of his window. <laughs> and he goes out and Michael says to me, he goes, you know, you're not supposed to be here. And I go, I'm sorry, could you sign my ball? And he, yeah, give it to me. Uh, what's your name? Kyle. He's, and he goes, Carl. And I go, no, no, not Carl, not Carl. <laughs> Kyle. He writes to Kyle, Michael Jordan, tosses me the ball, Whoa. turns back up the Rhythm Nation and peels out. I still have the ball. In fact, I, I, sh I should go grab it. 
I almost, I have it here to this day. And wow. it's an amazing story. So, and then I just drove five minutes home. So it was living amongst the gods. I mean, it would have yeah. been you like running into like Gretzky at the mall yes. or something like that. It was really that yes. cool. Which is, I remember uh, running into a Grant Fuhrer uh, yeah. at the Magic Pan uh, restaurant, which was because in the mall, at the West Edmonton Mall, the big mall, they had a skating rink and the Oilers would practice oh, there is. sometimes. Yeah. And then Grant would want to go for a drink. And it was, I felt so bad for him because Edmonton's such a, you know, it's a small town in a lot of ways. So everyone was kind of just crowding around him as he just sat there quietly sipping a scotch. Probably so wasn't cool. the most pleasant experience for him, but it was sure great for us. I like getting a uh, scotch at the mall. That's pretty classic. Right? Right. That's what you do. That's what I get Pan Express. <laughs> That's right. We did get that too, but once in a while you had to wash it down with a nice, you know, uh, a nice hibiki or something like that. Um, so, and the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, because we have all these similar cultural references, you yeah. tweeted out recently. Uh, that was the 35th anniversary of Back to the Future. Yeah. And man, uh, we're so in the same wheelhouse on this one. I truly think it may be my favorite movie ever. Uh, yeah. It's certainly in my top five ever. You described it as a perfect movie, and I think that's so brilliant. Um, I would love to hear your memory of seeing it for the first time. I remember it well, and I was really young because uh, I was born in 79, so I was six. It came out in right. 85. That's right. I remember a lot of things. I think the strongest impression was you see this incredible movie and it, it, he just, he could have gotten back to 1985 and his family changed and it's a great movie and roll the credits. And then Doc Brown pulls up and he's yeah. screaming about this. It's your kids, Marty. It's your kids. He's got and the then, Mr. Okay, Fusion. Then, now, <laughs> yeah, he says from banana peels in. And okay, <laughs> so that's enough for a six-year-old. Now it's more than enough. You could end the movie yeah. there. And then he says, where we're going, we don't need roads. And I'm like, Doc Brown, what are you going to do now? Because my head is going to explode. <laughs> and the car flies. And you have to understand, in 1985, for a car to fly, I mean, we didn't have, like, you know, Blade Runner 23,000 or whatever. And we, we had nothing then. We had, like, some Ridley Scott movies and Star Wars, and they were all in space. The yep. fact that his car peeled out in the air above the suburbs – like, I feel like I became a man in that moment. And I was only six. I couldn't believe it. And it's crazy because in, I've looked into this, Jay. This is a deep cut. In the theater, it did not say to be continued. Ah, when they started right. airing it on TV and then they released the VHS, it said to be continued. So in the theater, you're like, what, is, is that it? Is that all we're going to get? And I just, it was so unbelievably magical. And it still is. And I know you relate to this, Jay, because you're a father. It's a movie that I think we could show our kids and they'll have the same reaction when he flies down the street. 100%. I think it, it holds up beautifully. And I'll take it a step further. I heard, and I believe Michael J. Fox said this, yeah. that, so you're right, they tack on the to be continued on the VHS and yeah. everything. And I, my understanding is they did that before they had signed Michael J. Fox to the sequels. Okay. So they were like, if he's in or not, we're doing sequels. That kind That's of thing, incredible. right? Like, yeah, it's a so play. it was a big time power move from Paramount or Spielberg or whomever, Zemeckis, I don't know who it was. But yeah, it, I mean, for it's me, incredible. I think of so many things. I remember uh, going into Edmonton, seeing it. People in my class had already seen it. They're like, it's unbelievable. You got to go. Going with my folks, coming out of the theater and immediately saying to my dad, I need a skateboard and I need it within <laughs> two days. I need a skateboard and I need it within two days. Luckily, my small town, an hour north of Edmonton, we go to the junk shop, we go to the used, you know, store with all the knickknacks, and there's a little banana skateboard like from 1972 or something like that. And I rode that bad boy for a while until I got my John Lucero Smith Schmidt Sticks uh, bad boy. But it, it kicked off the skateboarding thing. It was so exciting. Was it strange that he was hanging around with a 50-ish year old <laughs> single man with no children? Sure, maybe it was, but it's kids. I didn't think about it. I thought, wow, it would be so cool to have a best friend who's yeah. like that and who can do inventions and things like that. Tell um, me with this, Jay. All right, so Marty McFly. Marty McFly is, is a great skateboarder. He yep. is a, a, the lead guitarist and lead singer of like a really cool rock band. He the has the head. hottest girlfriend in the whole school. So, Absolutely. but he doesn't appear to have any friends at all. It's right. just like everything he does is cool. And I'll go one further. Mrs. McFly 
is not into him taking his hot girlfriend to the mountains to camp and make out, but she's totally fine with him hanging out with Dr. Emmett Brown for unknown amounts of time. Nothing jives there. And yet, no, it, I'm not going to criticize the movie. No, no, and, and, and it makes sense. And now there was a recent thing I, I'm sure you saw where, and I didn't even know about this, but apparently for years people have been saying this about, about the script, about the plot, that why is it when he gets back to 1985, why don't they recognize him as the Marty they knew back in 1955, yeah. right? Why don't they? And so as a kid, I never even, never even came to my head. Um, did that ever bother you? Or did, I know the screenwriter no. actually had an explanation for it. I, I, I think, think it's a cop out. I, it, put, put it this way. I think George and Lorraine were around Marty in 1955. I, I would say maybe a week. At, at the most how long right were there? right week? all right yeah so a week. imagine jay imagine you went to summer camp in the summer of 1970 you know no no wait yeah yeah 19 1970 1980 okay no no no. I'm not, my math is wrong 1990 30 years ago summer right. of 1990 for one week would you recognize a kid 30 years later you no. spent one week with no, even though you I, I had set you up with your wife or anything i don't think no. so Kyle, yeah. there's people working on our show right now. If I walked down the street, I wouldn't know who they were. <laughs> Stop. That's, that's also part true, of right? getting old, yes. I, I'm just kidding. Stop. That was just adding to the joke a little bit. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, Kyle, I, I, we're actually out of time. This is I'm having so much fun talking to you. Will you come back? And be, because I know that you're going to be so loved by our podcast listeners. Will you come back and, and we'll talk a little bit more about our favorite movies? And I would like, like to I come gonna... back if we can finish on a note of honesty. Jay, Let's how hear. long before you called me did Schrager say, no, I'm on vacation. I can't do it. Be honest. Uh, I'll be honest. So I called him yesterday. <laughs> I said, can you do the podcast tomorrow? He said, can't do it. And that was the end of that. And then I, I actually will say this. I, it wasn't immediately like I said. So this is me just being honest with you. I wasn't immediately like, oh, then I should get Kyle. It was more, well, who can I get that I haven't talked to that I really, I really want to talk to some. When I do the podcast alone, I like to sort of take it the way I like to take it. Dan, doesn't, Dan would not understand any of these references we just made over the last oh, 25 good. minutes. Nothing. Right. Right, he would not. He would be lost, completely lost. I would say Eric Stoltz was originally Marty McFly. Yeah. He's like, who the hell is Eric Stoltz? <laughs> so um, I guess I, I try to I try to book people when it's just me that I know I connect with on that type of level, that pop cultural yeah. level. And so your your name came to me, sort of like out of the blue, late last night. So it wasn't immediate. Right. So it was not really related to Schrager, but yes, I did try to try to get Schrager yeah. on the show. Jay, yeah, I love the show. I'll always do it. You don't need no credit card to ride this train. Anyway. <laughs> uh, buddy, um, as the great Charlie Daniels said, uh, uh, I told you once, you son of a bitch, I'm the best that's ever been. That's an awkward way to end an interview. <laughs> but that is a line uh, from The Devil Went Down. That's a Jordan. line. Thank, thank you, Kyle. Great talking to you, my friend. Anytime, Jay.